I originally was going to split the question on IP between um, inventions on the one hand, patents on the one hand, and uh, expressions of art or copyright on the other. Because I think there, there are two different issues involved, even though they're often lumped together in the same issue of uh, intellectual property. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I wanted to split the question is because I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not an inventor. I'm, I'm an artist, and so I've been intimately involved with the uh, copyright type issues for quite a while, both as an artist and as a producer, and as a, uh, a, a sort of a stand-in manager for a computer game company when we uh, uh, negotiate contracts with outside developers. Um, so I think I'm more comfortable, more familiar with, with that, but if people want to talk about uh, patents as well, at some point we can do that. <coughs> now, the intellectual property issue is something that has come up fairly recently due to the digital revolution and the ease of copying and the, the, the greater ease of spreading ideas. And also because of uh, corporate actions within the last several years essentially extending copyright uh, length and durations, I think unreasonably long. <coughs> and also this new uh, uh, act of Obama's that uh, um, I, I don't even know all the details of it, but from what people have been telling me, it's really going to lock up uh, uh, patents uh, and, and make it a lot harder to uh, work around patents or, or deal with uh, with ideas that are patented and maybe not appropriately patented. But I, you know, unless someone here knows more about that, we can discuss that. But if not, I'm going to stick with copyright. Um, it is true, as well, I'll, I'll, let me back up a little the, the issue has pitted me against people that I normally have a great deal of respect for uh, intellectually, uh, the, the people that are considered the libertarian left you know, by some labels or <coughs> voluntarists by other labels who believe that uh, no one can own an idea uh, and uh, by extension I guess no one can own a distinct expression of an idea which is what copyright protects. And uh, their arguments run the gamut from the history of copyright, and they're true on this. Copyright was originally a monopoly grant, not to authors, but to publishers. Uh, <coughs> the, the, I think it was called the Act of, Act of Queen Anne, or something like that. Uh, that essentially granted a, a protection of publishers so that, supposedly so that they would invest the time in doing proper copy editing of a work before it's published, otherwise they didn't think they could uh, uh, realize enough income from publishing the work unless they had that protection. And you know, it's probably pretty much like every other uh, monopoly privilege and granted it was cooked up by some smart people uh, in order to make extra money off of government privilege and they're quite right about that and then it evolved into protection of authors and then it was uh, around the time our constitution was put into place it was uh, such a popular idea among the classical liberals of the time that it was put into the Constitution that in order to encourage uh, the uh, creative works, we would grant creators a, a limited monopoly for a limited time on the, ability, on the, on the right to publish uh, those works. And when you look at the history of it, you know, the anti-I people have a very strong argument that it wasn't really a natural right is a legislative right that was uh, designed to protect special interests. But just because, uh, just because the government doesn't protect proper, property properly, or just because the government has a poor history of determining what is property and what isn't, doesn't mean that we have to <coughs> throw out uh, any idea of a property right, even though there might be some merit to it. You know, take for example the issue of slavery. When our country was founded, it was believed that people could own other people. And eventually we worked out that no, you can't do that. that everyone is a, uh, an end in and of himself, and everyone has a right to his own life and his own body. And so we threw out slavery. Uh, so uh, the, the, the history of government, uh, the history of government malfeasance is, is not an argument against intellectual property. Uh, The argument for, um, there's, like I said, this is going to be a structure. In 
During the Renaissance, there was no concept of intellectual property. Basically, uh, artists, to in order to work and live for a living, had to find a patron. They had to find a wealthy person that would support him while he does some work and pay him and give him his upkeep. And he lived a bit on his fame, but he very rarely lived on selling his own works. He was usually on doing work for a patron, and the patron would have it and, and sell it. And because there was very little publishing in those days, and very little, but it was could so much. He couldn't sell much, right? <clears throat> With the inventing and expansion of the, of the printing press, it became a different matter for authors and for certain artists <clears throat> who suddenly could make uh, thousands of copies of their work fairly inexpensively and sell them. And that was great for the first person to do that. But uh, after six months or you know six weeks or six months, if something grew popular, everyone else could jump in and start copying and selling the same stuff, essentially going into competition with the originator of the work. And uh, the originators are naturally upset about this. And <clears throat> it's not just because uh, we're seeing money going out the door that we think we should have. There's a connection <clears throat> between an artist and what an artist creates that goes down deeper than that. And as an illustration of what I mean by it feels that, a little bit like theft. Uh huh? It has a, it has it, a, it feels, a feeling it feels, of theft. It's, it's not just that. There's, if, if you go back to the Austrian theory of original property, it, it says that if a person takes an, an item that was in the commons, you know, something from from the land or, or, or something from the water that had not been previously owned by anyone, and mixes his labor with it, transforms it into something useful, and that becomes his property. Why? Because it was that person who has the closest relationship to that item that was transformed. And it's a relationship that's what's important. Uh, if, uh, if I had audio-visual here, if I'd known I'd had audio-visual here, I'd be putting up a, an image of a, a statue that's very famous. Everyone knows what it is. It's like a, a new 13-year-old boy with a sling over his shoulder. And you show that picture to most educated people, and they will, they will recognize it instantly as Michelangelo's statue of David, or Michelangelo's statue of David. The thing is, Michelangelo never actually owned that statue in the legal sense of the term. The, uh, the marble that it was carved out of was, was quarry and was brought to town by a, essentially, a, 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 what you could think of as a, as a modern, or old equivalent of a chamber of commerce of, um, of uh, Florence. town leaders in Florence. They had this real long, complicated name that I should have written down. But it, it was never Michelangelo's property, but he was, he was the one who carved it, he was the one who created it. He is the one without, he is the individual without whom that statue did not exist. And so he, had, and so we all recognize implicitly that he has a special relationship with that work of art. Now, going forward to the to the present day, this is true of every artist and every creation that an artist makes. If I draw a picture or write a song or, or do whatever creative thing I want to do, that particular expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves would not exist without the creator putting it together. Uh, L. Neil Smith wrote The Probability Roach. Most of you have heard of that story. It's, it's like a classic libertarian science fiction uh, story that has a lot of interesting ideas in it, very few of which actually originated with Neil. He picked these up you know, in, from, from other books or from other works, and he did originate some ideas himself. But what makes that story uniquely his is the unique expression of it. No other person for him in all likelihood, or, or even in the slight likelihood, would be able to put together, would have put together that story if Neil had done it. And that's true with the comic strips I create, that's true with the song, the song that I write. The ideas are not what's being known, it's the expression of the ideas. It is, it is a product of a uh, creator's labor. Yeah, that's good. And uh, when I bring up the labor matter, the IP opponents say, well, you're talking about the labor theory of value, aren't you? And I said, no, it's the labor theory of property, which is implicit in the Lockean theory of property rights, which have been adopted mostly you know, by Austrians and other free market economists. So <clears throat> we get to uh, the problems that come up for protecting intellectual property rights. And one of the most famous, one of the most famous recent ones was a, guy named, a woman named Nina Paley, 
who put together a sort of a retrospective uh, uh, piece of animation combined with some music that she wanted to honor some obscure, unknown jazz performer. And she obtained the rights to the recording of the work uh, to put with her animation piece, but then after she had spent like $70,000 producing this little animation, it was discovered that she had not obtained the rights to the, uh, essentially with, with music there's two sets of rights. One is the rights to the recording and the other is the rights to the original sheet music that recording that the uh, song was recorded from. And she had failed to obtain those pre prior rights. And so it, it sort of exploded in her face. She tried to contact the owner of those rights. They wanted an ungodly amount of money, and then they eventually did settle. But the uh, the uh, process was so, uh, was so difficult for her. And, was it litigated? Uh, huh? Litigated? No. Well, it was. There were there were lawyers involved, but it never went to court. Okay. It, was, it wasn't it litigated. Was, it, was, it wasn't litigated. It was negotiated. Yeah. I think originally they wanted fifty thousand dollars for the rights to, to use the song, and she you know, negotiated them down to fifteen. Um, and now Knight has become a champion of, of anti copyright. I said, well, if I copy something, I'm not taking it from you. You still have your original, and now I have my copy. And, you know, okay. And uh, if someone wants to copy one of my comic strips off the web and like use it as a screensaver or use it for some personal use, I'm not really harmed by that. I, I don't really have a complaint. But if someone could somehow obtain the high resolution copies of my work and go into competition against me, then I am damaged. And I have a problem with that. All right. Sorry, you have a seat. We couldn't find you. Yeah, I know. I they put us out here in Outer Mongolia hoping we wander off and get lost or something. Morning here, so I'm going to take it off my hand. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> copyright worked reasonably well for most people most of the time up until about 15 or so years ago when the internet became ubiquitous and uh, works were being copied a lot and, and people not paid for it, but there really was never a, a surge of. Um, the kind of bootlegging that we had prior to that in the 70s and 80s. I remember going to uh, 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 pop culture conventions and so forth where people were selling bootleg copies of, of albums and bootleg copies of videotapes. And the show would go for about two or three days, and on the third day, the cops would come in and raid all the bootleggers and <laughs> take all their money. So it was very profitable for the cops, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the cop but, didn't pay the original offer? Uh, well, you, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> this is happening. This is happening. It's not a crime. We'll get it to you later. But, uh, um, but with the internet, the internet essentially put a lot of those bootleggers out of business because you know, the internet eliminated the middleman. The middleman. And with file sharing, uh, whether the primitive sort uh, back in the 90s or the modern sort with uh, the successors to... Uh, uh, Napster. Napster. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it's uh, it's ridiculously easy to pretty, pretty much gank what you want off the internet, and so there is some truth to what my brother says about copyright, <coughs> and that is your your property rights are only as good as your ability to protect them. And if you're in a situation where you can't really protect your copyrights in the way that you used to, you need to find ways in which you can, and probably the most effective means of, of copyright protection, as it turns out, is probably the one the most agorists would can live with, and that is social appropriate. What? Social appropriate. Uh, uh, shunning. Uh, oh, you know, ostracism. Ostracism. Uh, just, just trash talking the people that do this. And it worked out, it has worked out pretty well in certain circumstances. There's a famous story about J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings. And The Lord of the Rings was first published in England, and then a few years afterward, uh, one of the American publishers obtained rights to the hardcover edition of Lord of the Rings and started publishing it here and was very successful with it. So another publisher called Ace um, somehow obtained the galleys to the, pay, trade, pay, uh, the paperback version, which had circulated in England already, and they used those galleys in order to uh, 
published without authorization uh, a paperback version of Lord of the Rings. And they could use the gallery, galleries? The galleys. The galleys. The galleys. The galleys are like, well, actually, they're. Yeah, actually, they did obtain the plates. I don't know how they did that. It's a printing <laughs> term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's the original printing master. Yeah. It's not out on one of these boats. Yeah, it's like. It's no, not, yeah. no, it's not a kitchen. <laughs> it's a master. It's a master. The shoes. I think it was the master. And. Um, and started publishing, and Tolkien found out about this and was really upset because he wasn't getting a cut of that deal. So he started a, a, a letter writing and publicity campaign. He was in contact with a lot of um, what you could call super fans, you know, people that were really into his work and also had a lot of friends they would talk to. And it was sort of a pre-internet network of, 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 fan, of fandom for uh, for his work. And he, what he did is he just. Uh, notified them, and he also had uh, his hard cover publisher print in, in, the, in, the, in the new edition a letter saying uh, the, tra the, the the paperback version of this story, which is being published by Ace, uh, was not authorized by me, and I'm not realizing any income from it. And I'd appreciate it if you didn't buy those books. And so what happened was <coughs> the people stopped buying the Ace version of the, tra of the paperback, and the bookstore started returning books back to the publisher in droves. They were like, we, they received tens of thousands of returns of those books because they weren't selling, because no one would, you know, <coughs> one Tolkien fans had found out about the problem, and they decided themselves that, you know, Tolkien should have the right to, uh, to receive a, a cut of whatever value that this book is the originator of the story. It would not exist without him. What's interesting about that story is that both sides of the IP debate cited as uh, uh, as one of their arguments. <laughs> Neil Smith told me the story, uh, and, and his conclusion from it was that, there, yes, there is a common law copyright, because common law essentially develops out of a, a social consensus of what is just and, and how a conflict should be resolved. And <coughs> on the other hand, uh, the anti ir people say, well, because we have this, you don't really need a government copyright. Well, they may be right in that. Uh, to an extent, the problem is, what do you do with people that don't have the, the network? That network. What do you do with uh, works that aren't uh, that don't create the kind of personal, you know, don't create a feeling of personal connection between a reader and an author, like a uh, uh, like an encyclopedia or like some kind of nonfiction technical book that is important and a lot of work went into, but. Uh, <coughs> You don't get that warm, fuzzy feeling of, of being connected to the author somehow in a way that you would be through a novel or through a movie or through a, even through a painting or, or a cartoon. <coughs> uh, there's no support there. But what you would probably get in, in an ascent if you ask people about this is, you know, should it, if a person does this, is this a nice thing to do to someone to, you know, to, to a, uh, an originator to make, to make unauthorized copies of his work and then go into competition against him with his own work and sell them. Well, that's kind of a douchebag thing to do. Maybe it doesn't rise to the level of uh, force initiation or property violation, but we don't like this and we wish you wouldn't do it. And I think you'll probably get most people to agree with that. Uh, there except are the ones that are the real assholes. Which except are, for the ones that are, yeah. This, is, this yeah. is where the you, problem happens. Yeah, there, there's that problem. And then there's also the problem of. Um, <coughs> of, uh, of old works that have fallen out of use and don't have a following anymore, and then someone rediscovers them and starts publishing them again without <coughs> without uh, contacting the, the originator or, or making any kind of deal like that. They just kind of pick it up and start selling it. Um, there, you know, there's there's no there's no common law protection there. Um, but should there be? And, and I've kind of gone around and around this personally because on the one hand, I'm, I'm a voluntarist. I'm a hardcore Ralph Hardy and an anarchistic, you know, smash the state. You know, we don't need no stick and bag just kind of guy. And on the other hand, I want to make a living doing this. Uh, smash the states? No. <laughs> yes, yes. He wants state really protection for his smashing the states. I want to be able to make a living smashing the state through my heart. <laughs> And the question is, do I need copyright protection to do that, or do I need something similar to copyright protection to do that? 
And obviously, it's a contradiction for me to ask the state to protect the work saying I should smash the state. But on the other hand, most of us are also propertarians and we believe in private property rights. And so, is it contradictory if someone breaks into our car for us to call the police? Well, no, because what we have now is we have the rights. We have a we have a system that we're not happy with, but we have to live in it. And the, the system is is that you, the government is our primary property rights protection agency. <clears throat> so it's it's not so much of a contradiction unless you want to be completely consistent about it. And there are a few who are. There are people that would not call the police. They would either take the loss or they would go after personally go after uh, whoever they thought had violated their property and, and it can be deal tough. with the complications, huh? It can, have to look at it, it can be tough, and, and you might just, you know, some people just throw up their hands and say, oh, well, some people will just call their insurance company and, and file a claim, and then that would be the end of it. <clears throat> and it's and essentially, in some versions of anarcho-capitalist theory, that's what you would do generally, is you would call your insurance company. Um, the insurance company would pay your claim, and the insurance company would try to decide whether it's worth the cost to try to go after the perpetrator or not. Most well, what, would be, not. What, what would be the effect of the insurance premium if there was no state that the, the insurance company could rely on? I don't know. It might be more expensive. I am too. But more. then you wouldn't be paying the taxes. And so it would, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be paying less out of one pocket, more out of another. And, and whether you'd be paying more in the long run is really anybody's guess. I mean, we have theorists and claim one way or the other, but nobody they really can, they can The state recovers property less than 5%. Right, right. Hi. The state, the state rarely recovers property. I've, I've been ripped off a few times of my physical property and I've never had a return. You know, I call the cops. Because usually the insurance companies will require that you call the police. And the reason they do that <coughs> is because they don't want you filing a false claim. And to protect against that, they make you file a police report because it's against the law to file a false re police report. I mean, there's like criminal penalties involved in that, so that discourages mm -hmm. people from filing false claims. Without that system, insurance companies would have to essentially uh, uh, hire more investigators to root out false claimants, and they do that anyway. Uh, uh, I have a friend who's a private investigator, and something like 80% of his business is finding out whether people really are injured to the extent they claim or really have lost the property they claim. So that goes on now. And it would take some, uh, yeah, I think it would take a lot of research to suss out how much, how much uh, actual benefit insurance companies receive from the fact that they're piggybacking on the state. And how much, the versus how much they're losing by the taxes they have to pay and how much we're all losing by the taxes we have to pay and the loss of our liberty that's involved with having to stay. But getting back to intellectual property, <clears throat> What I want to try to propose is, all right, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to back up. The anti-I people will say, what kind of property is it? When you say anti-I people, mean what do you have? People that about? believe that there should not be legal protection for for what is called intellectual property, whether it's uh, creative works or events. legal meaning common. Does that include common law? That they don't yeah. believe in common law either. Uh, for any kind of legal protection, whether it's in the, the present system we have or whether it's in some kind of future. So if someone creates something, it becomes public domain on that. Well, it's, yeah, as soon as you show it to someone else, it becomes it becomes everyone's property. And this is this is one of the objections that uh, Neil Smith has: is, is that this is socialism, essentially, because what you're saying is that what you make isn't yours; what you make is everybody's, and that's the socialist premise. And, you know, Everything that gets made is equally owned by everybody, and we need to all share and be nice. And <clears throat> yeah, it's it's easy to see how it looks that way, and it, and it kind of is that way. If if we have if we essentially take away uh, copyright protection and don't replace it with anything, and what I what I suggest is that we do replace it with something else that's more amenable to libertarianism, and essentially more amenable to the anarchist form of libertarianism. And that is uh, established essentially a consensus or an ideal that it's very, it's douchey to take someone's work <clears throat> and go into competition against them in the marketplace with it. It's, it's a crummy thing to do. It's, it's bad. It doesn't rise to the level of an assault. It doesn't rise to the level of the theft of physical property, but it's still something that needs to be discouraged in the same way we discourage uh, 
other I don't know if it doesn't right well, why, why I mean I, I, this water bottle cost me maybe 50 cents okay and that's physical property I could spend 10 years working on a piece of technology you know and pour you know essentially you know half a million dollars worth of my own personal effort into that right, right. and suddenly this is worth less than, than this, I mean more less than this bottle of water well according to Austrian economic theory Value is in the eye of the buyer, or it's, it's in the eye of the marketplace. So labor doesn't create value. What creates value is if you have something that... Okay, then let me substitute that. Left. So I have, I have something that there's an enormous demand for, and that the value, the, the market, it, right. the market would would assign that that value to it. Right. And and still, it's it's worth less than this. Yeah. And according to the theory you just said. Uh, according to yeah, according to uh, the anti-IP people. It's not, they're not saying it's worth less. What they're saying is that you don't have the right to recapture a portion of that value out of the price. That's what the anti-IP people are saying. What I'm, what I'm saying is that they, their arguments do have some merit because if, if, <coughs> if you create something that's intangible, it really only exists in people's minds or upon the medium in which it was placed. And if I write a song or I draw a cartoon or I write a book, and someone obtains that a copy of that and puts it on their hard drive or memorizes it, especially if, it may, if they memorize it, that it becomes part of their mind. And how can someone else own the, something that's part of my mind? Well, the answer to that is if uh, I uh, make an agreement with someone to park my car in their garage, then the car is in their garage, and but it's still my property. Just because you move something of yours into someone else's property doesn't mean it becomes their property. What you have is essentially a bubble of your property that exists within someone else's property. This is why when you step onto someone else's land, you don't lose all your rights to the landowner. You still have your, your set of property rights in your own body that sort of is contained in a bubble within the, the, the other property boundary within which you're sitting. Um, the problem comes back to <clears throat> yeah, I'm so um, The problem comes back to uh, the, the complications that often arise <clears throat> from collaborative works. Who, sh who should who should own the copyright to some works? These can be worked out in contract among the people that collaborate most of the time. A lot of times contracts aren't written, they're, they're assumed uh, they're, they're assumed by uh, standard practice or assumed just by the people that are involved in the work and then later on there's, there's a dispute. Um, well, that's also true of physical property. One of the weird things about intellectual property is, is the time limit. Uh, if you buy a house, and you maintain it, then you own that house theoretically forever. You pass it on to your kids, and then they'll own it, and they pass it on to their grandkids, and they'll own it. And there's no expiration date. <clears throat> but there is an expiration date on copyright, and there's a good practical reason for that, and that is that our culture would probably be a lot poorer <clears throat> if everything that was ever written since the beginning of time was locked up behind someone's copyright. Uh, if you couldn't quote from Shakespeare, if you couldn't quote from the Bible, if you couldn't quote from uh, Milton or, or from you know any, anyone else, then it would be a lot. You know, you would essentially have to be having to reinvent the wheel every time you wanted to express an idea. You couldn't use the, the common cultural knowledge of other works as as, as a, a basis for building on top of it. And most of our civilization is ideas and, and new constructions being built on top of new constructions. This applies more to patents than copyright. It applies to both. There is a, a, a situation where, where someone wanted to uh, <coughs> write a story set in late 19th century England and have Sherlock Holmes as a supporting character, not as a central character, but he would like come in and, and be involved at some point. And he wasn't able to get the rights to do that. And this, so essentially that story couldn't be written because Sherlock Holmes is a widely known character that has a history that most people know. And it becomes a sort of a shorthand for a lot of ideas and for a lot of history that <clears throat> could be economically inserted into another story. You know, you only have to mention Sherlock Holmes and a few other people, persons and places, and you have this whole backstory 
that you can then incorporate or, or, or pick ideas out of it and put it into yours, but you can't do that as long as Sherlock Holmes is copy, Sherlock Holmes stories are copyrighted. And that's a disadvantage. That, you know, that you, you could say, well, the, the, the new writer needs to you know, pony up his own, his own skill and talent, do a better job of expressing his idea, but a, a tool has been removed from a toolkit that he might otherwise have. And then there's, there, there's one other aspect that there's, there's one other uh, aspect of, of rights theory that, that comes into this, and that is in the origination of physical property, you're taking something that was provided by nature, essentially. It was, it was here pre-existing any human action. And I'm not going to go into geo-libertarianism, but there, you know, that, that idea is important, and the reason it's important is in creative works, you're not taking something that was provided by nature. You're taking things, you're taking words, you're taking concepts, you're taking ideas out of, of, of uh, an intellectual commons, out of, out of an intellectual commons that was essentially put together by other people. So if you're going to take something out of an intellectual commons, at some point it seems reasonable that at some point what you create should go back into it so that people in the following generations can then build upon that. And so that that is why there's a reasonable reason for an expiration date on copyrights, maybe also on patents, but like I said, I want to separate that out because I'm really not quite so familiar. What's the expiration on copyrights? Well, that's that's one of the problems that's come up. Originally it was 25 years, and then it went up to 50, and then it went up to 75, and now they want to raise it to 95, and you know, and the reason for this is, is because a certain corporations like Disney and, and others that uh, pretty much cons consider their, their copyrights their their capital. They're the, more, the most important part of their capital and they want to extend the life of that capital as long as they can. And you can kind of understand their position on this because if their capital was in land or if their capital was in buildings, well, buildings they don't have to worry about this. Yeah, they wouldn't have to worry about that. On the other hand, what this means is that um, the, the rich... There's a, a certain a, a whole section of the cultural commons, as it were, because everyone knows who Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all those characters are, and and we use it in conversation a lot. And there was uh, <coughs> used, you know, Mickey Mouse sort of a common so This is like a Mickey Mouse deal. We, we don't say that much anymore, but we were for a while. And there are all kinds of uh, situations and, and, and ideas that can be expressed and can be expressed conveniently and, and economically among people by making reference to some of the old Disney movies. And without that, uh, without that ability, uh, uh, it becomes more difficult to communicate. And in fact, Disney, and Disney itself built its fame and a lot of its reputation based on stories that they didn't know either. They came out of the cultural commons. The Snow White and the Seven Doors, that was a fairy tale. There was other fairy tales that were used. Some would say they pilfered uh, Lion King from Kimba the White Lion and got away with it. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of ironic when you have a corporation that was essentially built on creating things out of the cultural commons and being reluctant to allow. Christian Anderson and yeah. uh, authors from the 1800s. Right, right. Then turning around and not allowing any of their work to pass into the cultural commons in, in, in the same way the material that that they're building on had been. So you know it's uh, it's it seems like it should be fair that uh, that people will pay forward that have received some benefit from from the culture that they're in and to essentially once once they realize a good and decent profit of it to to give it back. Um, I know that kind of sounds kind of fuzzy socialist too, and, I, and I'm not sure what a better answer is to that. But do we really want to live in a society where, where uh, you know, you can't ever reference a uh, or you can't ever use a, a word from 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago without tracking down the the estate and, and the lawyers and all that? That would uh, that would really put a crimp on, on creative expression. Yes. Uh, and going forward, it would seem that if the author of his property, he could set the terms to say. You can't copy it, or yeah, you could have fair use and make reference. So why wouldn't the author be able to set the terms on how his own property is used? That's a good point. Um, <clears throat> he should be able to do that. And the, 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 some of the people that 
some of the libertarians way back in the 70s that first started questioning copyright, Wendy McElroy was, was one that I'm most familiar with, said that there should not be any kind of uh, government copyright, but there could be a contractual copyright. Essentially, you write uh, something like a EULA, uh, uh, end user license agreement, <clears throat> in the front of the book that says, by buying this book, you agree not to give it to someone else or not to reproduce it and, not, and, not, and sell it in the marketplace without my permission. What happens if uh, someone buys that book and then uh, takes it to uh, uh, the dentist's office and then leaves the book in the dentist's office and forgets it and then someone else picks up the book? Is he bound by that contract? There's well, over reason. time, you'd, you'd think that just like common law evolved, you know, these issues would come up and then they would be dealt with in a fair way and that would be accepted and it would, it would go forward. Yeah. What are you proposing? I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused now. What in other words, I mean, I mean, the author can relinquish the rights if he wants. In he other words, yeah. this addressed the original point. Well, as far as not being able to quote Shakespeare, well, the authors could say, yeah, you can quote me and stuff like that. But then you said, well, well yeah, but what about this? What about that? So I'm saying, just like over the centuries, common law evolved with all kinds of issues. What about this? What about that? That, that they worked it out as they went along because things would come up. Similarly, with those type of situations, what if you left it in the dentist's office? You know, there are, you know, similar situations would come up and they would work themselves out maybe in a common law or type of a situation over, over some type of adjudication. Perhaps it was, but... Uh, Isn't that what copyright is? No. Not exactly. Copyright is the terms are set by the government. And uh, it's set by the well, government. Well, whether it's set by government or it could be by common law, was, I mean... Well, what he's suggesting is the terms be set by the author. For, for, for the use, for how his property well, is. He would say in perpetuity then. And yeah, and he might and say in perpetuity, and then, right. no one, then no one could use it forever and ever. Right. Uh, even if his heirs decide that they want to release it, they can't do that either. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you run, you run into problems there. I mean, you could have bookstores that, that one says we have this in policy and in place, and others that don't, and customers would go to one or the other, and they know the terms of this one or that one. and. You know, there's all kinds of ways. Yeah. You know, to be dealt with. Well, what, what we've seen is that you, you know, for for novels and for works that, that give people a, a feeling of being connected to the author, they will avoid purchasing unauthorized copies, and they will tend to want to purchase copies that they know some part of the purchase price goes back to the author or the artist. Uh, but not all creative works are like that. Reference works, uh, encyclopedias. Uh, works that have actually been put together by a large number of different people don't create that connection. And it's uh, not clear that uh, if you, uh, uh, it's not clear that people would see a distinction <clears throat> or really care whether or not uh, the money that they're paying for that book or for that whatever work it is they're buying goes to anyone except the bookstore owner. I mean, yeah, and then it uh, uh, brings in questions of the whole legal structure and how to deal with property yeah. protection, just like how is property protected here, where we said only 5% of uh, stolen property is returned, so it doesn't work so well in terms of the intangible property here. That's, that's true, that's true. So you essentially, you, you buy an insurance policy to protect your property, and you're sort of placing a bet. You're placing a bet that you're going to get ripped off, and you're going to wind up uh, getting more back from insurance company that you pay the premiums and the insurance company is betting the opposite way. That's because we don't catch the criminals. Right, right. And we don't, and it might be, it might, it might actually be less expensive to do it that way than to spend the resources catching the crooks, or it may not be it really, you know. Uh, that's, something some, that's something that someone would have to take a long and, and hard and serious look researching and looking into and finding out what, what, what is the, the least the most cost-effective way of dealing with that sort of thing, and and that is an essentially an argument for putting and pulling everything into the market because market actors do have an incentive to do that research and, and figure out if an insurance company was also a dispute resolution organization. They used to find a all use term. Uh, so he, a dispute resolution organization. Would that his term? Dispute resolution. No, before that, it's term. Oh, Stefan Molyneux. He's uh, he's like the MC. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I and he's, and he's, uh, he's had quite a lot to say about this issue and others. And, and this dispute resolution organization is his term um, 
other terms of you, other people who use uh, private protection in the city. Or yeah, have you heard of Andrew private. Glumbos, by the way? Who? Andrew Glumbos. Well, I've heard of him. Because you, you mentioned um, primary property, because he he'd, he'd actually, you know, he was active in the 60s and 70s, oh, yeah. and he actually defined property in terms of primary property, which is like intellectual property, secondary property, tangible property. So when you said primary property protection, okay, right? I was, I I was, a, I was using it to Glumbos, you can say. Yeah. I've heard of Glumbos. I haven't read anything he's written. I've only, you know, what little I know about him is like second and third hand, so... I, it's a complicated you know, story, but yeah. Yeah, I know. What I do know is that he's very extreme uh, pro-intellectual property, pretty much right. to the point where he wants you to put uh, money in the slot every time you quote from his book. Apparently that's apocryphal, the he had some enemies, but... Yeah. Some, I mean, he had his own <coughs> works. You I don't only think that's put money one. in the slot if you find it's profitable to you to do so. Is that is it, that's you're right. familiar with Columbia, you do okay. it because it's pro and he did put money in the slot for Thomas Paine and Isaac Newton just to make a show to his students. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and but they didn't really get that money, did they? Well <laughs> you've got to figure or their out heirs. who the mm. heirs are. Yeah. I don't know I don't think he got far enough to figure that out. Yeah, and what do you do in cases like that where you where it, it's it's Incredibly expensive or difficult or impractical to find the heirs to the owner of, of property, of, of intellectual property that originated 200 years ago. I mean, well, going forward, it's like the whole history of the world up <coughs> now has been crime and devastation, so we're trying to learn how to have a better way, but with right. computers, with technology, you know, it's getting easier and, and the cost of doing stuff like that is going down all the time. One of Lawrence's concepts, along with primary property, was that... Well, wait a minute, before, you, before you say anything, am I going to have to pay Glamis' heirs for what you're about to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he didn't have any children. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, I'm, uh, okay. That's another whole question. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry for interrupting you. And, 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 and you know, I, 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 I destroyed my... Uh, Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I'd like to get you guys to. You're talking about uh, taking a phrase from a book and, and copyright. The book is copyrighted. It's like I make a painting, and then I come up to you and I said, "You made a painting using blue. I have blue, so you owe me money." Mm -hmm. I'd prefer we talk about the entire work. But you're not the person that came up with blue. Maybe I was. No, well, no. Then, then it doesn't matter. If you're going to yeah. talk about these individual yeah. little pieces, right. like like using a word from a book or using one color from a painting, then you owe that money in the slot to whoever did first come up with blue. But, I, but, but you've got a whole painting and you've got a whole book, and I don't hear any discussion about that. <clears throat> you guys are all talking about just taking a quote from a book. I'm, I mean, somebody that's going to take, you, you mentioned right, the Encyclopedia there, 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 are, there are elements of works that are unique to that work, and there are elements of works that are common to all works. The color blue is, is common to not maybe all paintings, but most of them. But a particular, a particular unique image that first appeared in that painting and never appeared to anyone else, you have, a, I think, a better claim on, even if it isn't the whole painting. If you're the first person that came up with a, uh, a, a winged lizard with... Uh, Paisley stripes going down along his flank and, and stars going up his other flank and he's got <laughs> weird, he has a 15 horn sticking out of his head. You, you, you know, if, if you create an image that's a part of that painting that is unique to that painting, <clears throat> and, and, this, and, and this goes back to the relationship of a creator to his, to his intellectual property, if, if, if you can call it that, and that is, it's, 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 it's that relationship. It's, it's something that came out of your mind that hasn't, to anyone's knowledge, been done before, been done in quite that particular way, and then you can make a claim on that. You can't claim make a claim on a color. Uh, you can make a claim maybe on a sufficiently long passage out of a book. We have this idea uh, that's kind of bundled in, in a copyright called fair use. So that if you, t you can take a short quote out of a book, so long as you attribute where that quote came from, and if you're using it for certain particular purposes, like for review purposes or reviewing the book, obviously you need to make criticism. Is the most important aspect. Criticism, 
education, you know, you know, certain uh, uh, certain uses are considered okay, but uh, if you like were to take the, a, a series of sentences out of a book and then rearrange them in a different order and then publish them as your own and try to make money off of that, that's not, that's uh, that's not accepted by anyone that I know of. Um, so I'm. I'm, I'm well, I don't know. I just I'm hearing rare references to uh, complete works where everybody's picking parts out of it. If I take one uh, clip out of the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, I, I can't imagine why I would do that without referencing Encyclopedia Britannica to give it some weight. <clears throat> Say this is what the Encyclopedia Britannica said. If I'm not doing that, then am I going down to Borders and saying here I've got Dan's encyclopedia and when you open a book you find that it's encyclopedia britannica where i just scratch their name off and put my name in well, those yeah. are you know those are easier concepts to deal with sure yeah they're easier but i'm not quite I'm still not sure what your point is that i'm not hearing any comments about complete works about everything complete is, works you okay, guys are well, you guys are piecing it up which frankly is like the color blue I used it first. Yeah, I was trying to talk about difficult cases. Oh, okay. Well, you were. <laughs> it was getting a little too difficult. Uh, okay. The, the easy cases, yeah, if you take someone's entire story or someone's entire uh, uh, catalog of music or even an entire song or an opera or a, uh, um, sculptures don't get copied much, but um, you know, an entire piece of work and then strip the author's name on it and put your own on, that's plagiarism. And even the anti-IP IP people that I talk to are against that because they consider it a form of fraud. Fraud is uh, a violation of rights, uh, and, and so you can you know you can you can legitimately stop it that way. But what we're talking about is, is someone uh, taking a piece of work, leaving the author's name on it, or even taking the author's name off of it and putting anonymous in its place. And then selling it in the marketplace in competition with the uh, authorized copies of the work. That is the nut of what is important. That is half of what is important to creators. <clears throat> and it is kind of the nut of the IP argument. What I'm trying to probably not very well uh, bring up is that there's another connection between the creator and his creation that's more personal. Uh, when I write and, and draw <clears throat> my comic strips, I'm putting a bit of me into it, a bit of my heart, a bit of my soul, a bit of my mind. And it is enormously annoying to me if someone would be able, if someone were to take that and do something with it that I didn't authorize because it's essentially negating my relationship with that work. Just as the same as most people would be incensed if uh, someone came up and said, your children are not yours anymore. I mean, you're not claiming to own your children in the sense of they're being your property, but they're still your children and you have a bundle of common law rights and responsibilities with regard to those children. And someone for someone to come up and say, well, you can't own those children, therefore they're not yours, is, is going to you know, create an argument. And this is the same argument with, with intellectual property, and that is maybe we need a better term than property. Uh, maybe we should just call it uh, creation or something. You know, we come, need to come up with a better term to sort of dis distinguish it, because I do see the differences between uh, intangible rights <clears throat> to a creation and tangible rights to the, the medium on which the creation is placed. Like if I write something and put it in my computer, I, you know, no one questions my right to own my computer. But if, uh, I, uh, and if I allow someone to obtain a copy of some of the information that's on that computer and then they do something with it that I didn't tell them they could do, do I have a, a claim against them? And, and that's where the dispute lies. And my, uh, my claim is that you have, you have violated the relationship between the creator and his creation if you, if you, do, if you make any unauthorized use of that creation. Uh, the problem then becomes well, how long does that how long does that relationship last? Does it last past your death? And I'm not sure that it does. I mean, when you die, your children are, children are still technically your children, but you can't claim any rights because you're not there to, to claim the rights. So if you die, does your intellectual property remain your property or not? Or how come can you make that claim when you pass it on to your children? It's like you pass your physical property on to your children. But it's. Uh, 
as someone pointed out, we have copyrights so that uh, writers and artists can earn a living, not so their grandchildren don't have to. And and is there is is there a common law support for essentially creating a, a, that kind of intangible right that would allow uh, people to essentially prevent people from using their physical property <coughs> in in the way that they choose? And I'm not sure that there is. And uh, but I don't want to throw out copyright either. So it, it's. It's, it's kind of difficult for me. One of the reasons I wanted to come and give this talk is I wanted to essentially start a discussion uh, uh, among people that I uh, I was kind of hoping for some of uh, for Sheldon Richmond or someone like that to show up because I've been debating with this this with him and uh, he, he's not here. It's unfortunate. I'm getting a sense that most of the people here uh, support some, at least some version of historical copyright. Is it, is, is, is and, anyone, is and, patent, that, and patent. And patent. And, like, and I'm sorry, I, I kind of divorced patent out of, out, of, out of that because I'm not sure how I feel about it. There's also that. trademark. Trademark is, is, is something that's, that even the IP people support because essentially, it's, you mean uh, the anti-IP people? Yeah, anti-IP people are not generally anti-trademark. Mm -hmm. Because trademark is essentially establishing an identity for, uh, for a business enterprise. And to violate a trademark is essentially to commit fraud. It's, it's kind of like roughly the equivalent of, of plagiarism. You know, claiming a, a work is yours when it's not, or claiming a, uh, or, or creating confusion in people's minds as to, you know, is which business they're actually dealing with. So that, that's why you have trademark protection. And I'm not quite sure how trademark protection would work uh, in an in anarcho uh, voluntary system, but you know, that's something that theorists can work out. Um, Murray Rothbard famously said not too long before he died that uh, he, hadn't, he hadn't said a whole lot about intellectual property, he made a few comments on it here and there. But his, his last known position was that he was in favor of some kind of copyright but not patent, and it wasn't because he was a writer and not an inventor. But he didn't elaborate on that. Um, I'm currently but writing. If he wasn't an inventor, that, that gives you, I mean, yeah. <laughs> inventors tend to be people who are more pro patent, like yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you invest yeah. years and years of your life in something. Right, yeah. And I mean, then someone comes along and says, well, it's not your property. You're, you're, yeah, you know, right, it's, it's, it's a little bit it's a little bit offensive. It's a little bit offensive. And what the answer to that is that there may be other ways aside from the patent system, which has a considerable number of flaws in it. Oh, this is true. Uh, that, that inventions can be protected to some extent through the judicious use of trade secrets. And essentially, you know, being really good at making sure all your employees sign non-disclosure and making sure that everyone involved in the process that you're doing doesn't, you know, doesn't spill the beans. That, 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 that depends that very significantly on yeah. the nature of the technology involved. Yeah, Some things right. are much more amenable to trade secrets and other things are just yeah, almost, almost impossible. That's, that's, that's true. And, yeah, uh, and I don't know what you're going to do about that. Well, I had a very interesting idea, at least interesting to me that occurred on this, is that you're setting up uh, in copyright, one of the things that's being looked at is that you're setting up an organization to protect you from your own self-created fears. You have a fear uh -huh. that this is going to, that your economics is going to be uh, impinged upon. And therefore you're looking for someone to protect you from that fear. Okay. And this is what occurred in, in government to a great degree. You know, you're, they're, uh, sitting, they're inviting you to be afraid uh, that, you, that aggression is going to occur from another nation, and we will protect you against that aggression. And then that develops into a, a massive problem in itself because the fears are being turned over for somebody else to protect you. And it, 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 it has a relationship to the copyright concept to me. Yeah. 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 Well, there, there are different strategies. There are different strategies one could use because essentially the internet is, is pretty much anarchic anyway. And I know very few people that never downloaded a song or never downloaded a TV show or never downloaded a movie without going through the proper channels and paying the source. Um, <clears throat> I, I used to work in the game development industry, and, and uh, pirating was rampant. You know, uh, <clears throat> 
to the extent that, we, that everyone thought they could get away with it, uh, we would use pirated copy, copies of uh, development software of Photoshop, of uh, Maya, and the 3D graphics. Until such time as a disgruntled employee would go and, and call the cops, and then we'd say, oh, we're sorry, we didn't, we didn't realize what was going on, and then they'd show the seats. That's, that's, a, that's a common story in a lot of different uh, development companies. I know in the games business, we're probably in some other software <coughs> development. So there's a lot of hypocrisy that goes on goes in, in with copyright protection because it's become so easy now to violate copyright. Well, it's coming into invention too because they're yeah. coming up with printers that can print yeah. you out a machine. Uh -huh. You know, three-dimensional printer. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and what happens? What happens when the only what happens is it'd be interesting to see what happens to the economy when that technology develops further because pretty soon you're going to get to the point where no one will actually have to build a TV set. Just no one will, yeah, yeah. No one will actually have to build a car or assemble anything. You just, or yeah, maybe a final assembly of different parts that are printed up. Uh, and which the most, the, the most important aspect of, of anything is the skill work that went into designing it. And uh, how do you reward the people that do that skill work? I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> and, and, and in the digital age, you know, is 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 the point of my. my I uh, <clears throat> quoted my brother saying earlier, is your property rights really only as good as your ability to protect it? And in the digital age, how do you protect intellectual property rights? And there is some ways that authors and painters can do that, and musicians can do that, essentially through the force of their fan base. Uh, but uh, some of the designs of better car probably wouldn't be able to have that fan base. Some of the designs of uh, a better sailboat or a better whatever, you know, New camera or something like that that can just be printed up as soon as the design becomes available. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you reward the inventors? I don't know. I, I only know where to look is Bev Doolittle. She's covering new ground in enforcement of that kind of thing. She's an artist, but she's doing it all herself. She is policing it. And, and you know, Imagine that costs her quite a bit of time and money to police that because she's after yeah, anybody. Yeah. Well, it's 10 o'clock. We're pretty near Thank 10 o'clock, so we'll call time on this. And thanks, Thank everyone, you. for listening to the and Maybe we'll figure something out for this. <laughs>